Hello, thank you very much for the kind invitation uh, to uh, share our work with you today on photonic crystal biosensors. And thank you, Ralph, for organizing this special symposium. And also, you're great to be able to um, you know, come to IEEE Sensors Conference and be in this uh, enormous room, just thinking how great it would be to fill the room with photonic crystal sensor enthusiasts. You know, maybe in a few years from now, we'll have that many people. Uh, so uh, the, the area of photonic crystal biosensors goes back a, at least um, you know, 15 years with, with the first structures you know, fabricated out of uh, glass and plastic materials, uh, structures that can be illuminated from the side via waveguides that have defects in them, uh, structures that, that have um, you know, waveguides built into them, uh, even uh, flow-through devices and ones that, that can be made and integrated with uh, optical fibers. Um, there are, are one-dimensional, you know, two-dimensional photonic crystals, uh, such as the one-dimensional photonic crystals shown here uh, that, that couple in an array format uh, to, uh, to waveguides. Uh, what I'd like to uh, emphasize in my talk today is a structure that, that my group uh, works on primarily, uh, which is a photonic crystal slab, uh, also known as a guided mode resonance filter. Uh, the key uh, part of this structure is that it's uh, fabricated with a periodic surface uh, made out of a low refractive index material, uh, such as glass or plastic, uh, that has... Oh, a, a high refractive index a coating of a titanium oxide or silicon nitride applied to the top of it. And so this is like an open phase photonic crystal so that its upper surface can interact with a liquid media uh, that's in contact with it that carries the, the biological stuff. And so if we look at a structure like this from, from above, this is one that's uh, made by replica molding out of plastic. Uh, we would see a, a one-dimensional surface photonic crystal comprised of an array of high and low uh, places. And this structure is designed to have a very specific optical characteristic. Uh, we, we choose you know, the period, uh, the, the depth, um, the thickness of the titanium oxide, and all the refractive indices of the materials uh, to make this structure act as a high-efficiency optical reflector uh, that interacts specifically with a narrow band of wavelengths uh, that are reflected with you know, nearly 100% efficiency. Uh, depending on the choice of the grading period, uh, we could make this structure reflect any wavelength that we want, from ultraviolet all the way out to mid-infrared. And this particular one is made to, uh, to reflect a wavelength around 850 nanometers, or just uh, barely in the infrared. Um, so something special is happening at that resonance wavelength. And if we were able to uh, shrink ourselves down uh, to nano size and to you know, see the electromagnetic fields you know, on the photonic crystal surface, we'd see something like this here with time uh, slowed down substantially. Um, at the resonant wavelength, the electric field couples to the photonic crystal structure and, and forms a standing electromagnetic field, you know, a standing wave. And so at this, wave, uh, at this wavelength, uh, the light is not allowed to propagate laterally, but instead is confined uh, inside the photonic crystal structure itself. Uh, but, but also, you see that some of the light extends into the liquid media uh, that's on top of the photonic crystal. And this is where our, our sensitivity for doing biosensing is going to originate from in this uh, evanescent field. Um, there are several ways of producing uh, photonic crystal structures like this. Uh, one method that my group favors is a process called replica molding, uh, where we use a silicon wafer uh, that's used as a mold that, that has the periodic structure embedded into it by etching, uh, but then we can uh, squish you know, a thin layer of liquid, a UV curable epoxy, um, you know, underneath the, the silicon wafer between uh, the silicon and a uh, polyester sheet. Um, and then when we uh, cure that by exposing the ultraviolet light, um, we can um, have that solid epoxy structure that we overcoat with titanium oxide. Um, so th this process allows us to make you know, large photonic crystals very inexpensively, even out of flexible plastic materials. And, and in fact, um, these devices have been you know, commercialized and, and incorporated into a variety of biosensing microplates used in life science uh, applications. Uh, in order to do uh, label-free biosensing with a photonic crystal, uh, we, we have uh, you know, material, biomaterial, such as you know, virus particles, you know, proteins, or DNA, that all have a slightly higher refractive index than that of water. And so when, when these uh, materials incorporate you know, into the photonic crystal surface, essentially they displace a little bit of water and, and it change um, the, the resonance wavelength, uh, causing it to shift from a lower value to a higher value. Uh, now, measuring a shift in this re reflected wavelength is very simple. That all we need to do is to illuminate the structure uh, from below uh, with, uh, with white light, so all wavelengths go in, uh, but only one wavelength comes back uh, and gets it reflected, that we can detect that, that reflected wavelength with the spectrometer. Uh, another uh, property that photonic crystals have at that resonance wavelength is the ability to uh, concentrate the electric field energy uh, on, into that 
uh, evanescent field you know, on the photonic crystal surface. And so if we you know, have a fluorescent dye molecule and put it on the photonic crystal surface, uh, at the resonance wavelength, it'll experience a much higher electric field than it ordinarily would if it were sitting on an unpatterned piece of glass. And so this phenomena called enhanced excitation uh, can cause a fluorescent dye to give off more light uh, than it ordinarily would. Um, the photonic crystal can also be designed to have a second resonance at the wavelength that a fluorophore would emit. Uh, in this way, uh, the fluorescence emission that would ordinarily go off in all directions in spherical coordinates will be channeled mostly upwards uh, where the detection optics can detect it uh, more efficiently. And so we call this phenomena enhanced extraction. And I'll show how we use uh, photonic crystal enhanced fluorescence combining the excitation and extraction phenomena to get very low limits of detection for fluorescent-based assays. Uh, and so in our work, we're you know, making you know, photonic crystals. And if you have a good you know, hammer, we look for many different ways to use it. And so in the, in the work that I'll show you going forward, uh, we're using it as a label-free sensor, as a fluorescence enhancer, and also as a narrow bandwidth optical filter. And I'll show you some new work that we're doing with laser uh, biosensors that incorporate photonic crystals. So I'd like to start off by, by talking about uh, one of the applications in which we've been developing uh, mobile uh, you know, sensing instruments uh, that utilize the properties of photonic crystals, in this case, uh, developing a portable test for HIV viral load. And here we're making a photonic crystal that's in the format of a microscope slide. Um, this photonic crystal has a slightly lower period than the ones I showed you initially, uh, so that they produce a resonance in the visible part of the spectrum around 632 nanometers. Uh, and so um, similar to what I showed you, if, if we take uh, broadband light from an LED, shine it through the photonic crystal, uh, that one narrow band of wavelengths that was reflected uh, re results in a dip in the transmission spectrum that we can measure with a spectrometer. And so here we'll be measuring you know, shifts, positive shifts in the uh, transmission dip um, as virus particles attached to this photonic crystal. Um, we, we constructed a, a special purpose cradle uh, for an iPhone 4 um, that allows us to take an external light source uh, such as a, um, a incandescent lamp, um, uh, take that light through a, a pinhole and collimate it and send it through the photonic crystal. Um, this cradle um, has about $200 of optical components. One of the components is this diffraction grating that's put right over the, um, the back-facing you know, camera of the iPhone. Um, the, the basic idea is that we can turn the phone into a high-resolution spectrometer uh, in the following way. Uh, so rather than taking a, a photo of your friend, when, when your, um, your device is inside this cradle, um, we, we measure you know, the spectrum of whatever, whatever light enters that pinhole. And so um, if we measure you know, the, the spectrum of a photonic crystal, um, this is what we would see, this, this dip in the transmission spectrum, in this case around 560 nanometers. Um, if we put the photonic crystal into the optical path, whoops, um, we, we get a, a dip in the reflection spectrum that, that results in this dark band uh, in, in the transmission spectrum, I'm sorry, uh, that now we see in the pixels of, of the camera's image. And so we, we can calibrate you know, the pixels in the image to actual wavelengths uh, by shining a green laser pointer or a red laser pointer into the pinhole uh, which, which allows us to uh, know, you know the exact wavelengths of everything entering that system. Uh, and so um, you know, using this approach and, and making an a, you know, app that some students at Illinois uh, you know, put together, um, we're able to do uh, biosensing measurements using the phone. Uh, one of the applications that we're interested in is being able to, to do a direct measurement of HIV virus in a serum sample. And so in this case, we're preparing the photonic crystal with capture antibodies that specifically recognize uh, proteins that are expressed on the outside surface of live HIV particles. Uh, when the you know, HIV uh, binds uh, with the photonic crystal, it shifts the reflected wavelength, which results in a shift in that transmission dip um, that I just showed you. I'd like to just you know, briefly share some of the results of this. Um, we, we can measure you know, the wavelength shifts that occur due to the immobilization of you know, the capture antibody, the blocking step, and then the HIV. Um, you know, here shows in, in units of wave, peak wavelength value in nanometers um, going from high to low concentrations of virus uh, in serum um, with our detection limits around 10 to the fifth uh, per uh, milliliter uh, of material. Uh, just to give you an idea what the uh, virus actually looks like on the photonic crystal, here, here they are. You know, they're, they're scattered around um, in you know, these individual groups, but e even with these low densities, we're able to detect uh, wavelength shifts that, that occur due to their attachment. Um, the, the next thing I'd like to share with you is, is some uh, new work that we're doing where we're making uh, laser biosensors uh, with specific emphasis on doing uh, some very challenging assays for uh, small molecule you know, drug detection and high throughput drug screening. 
in, in this work, um, we're really a challenged by um, what we're trying to do, which is to immobilize a large protein on our uh, biosensor surface and to detect the incorporation of a small molecule, a drug, um, that has you know, vastly smaller molecular weight and that are, are generally weak binders. Um, small molecules like this are impossible to uh, functionalize with uh, labels like fluorescent tags without changing the, the drug's uh, you know, function or the interaction with the target protein molecule. And also, these types of experiments are, are of interest in pharmaceutical companies who want to screen through hundreds of thousands of, of chemical compounds in a single day. So this type of assay needs to be uh, simple and fast. Um, now, we, with the photonic crystal, we're able to measure these uh, resonance wavelength shifts of the photonic crystal, but we're very interested in being able to measure really small changes in wavelength that occur when small molecules attach to a large immobilized protein. And so our, our thought was to uh, turn the photonic crystal surface into one mirror of an external laser cavity, uh, where we have an external source of optical gain in the form of a semiconductor optical amplifier chip um, that shines light into the photonic crystal, but that reflected light is channeled back you know, into, the, into the SOA, uh, which then re-reflects the light back with some gain. And the idea here is to have lasing emission occur, so th through the uh, spontaneous emission process, uh, those broad photonic crystal resonances turn into extremely sharp laser resonances, and we can detect changes in the laser wavelength as biomolecules bind to the photonic crystal. And so our, our system looks like this, where we have our SOA chip is, is outside the photonic crystal. Um, it, it's coupled to two optical fibers. Uh, one of them just bounces against a mirror, and the other one shines against the photonic crystal in this uh, microplate format, and the reflected light goes back into the SOA. Um, this amplifier is designed to have a broad band of wavelengths that can, be, uh, that can apply gain um, over all the wavelengths that we expect our photonic crystal to ever reflect back. Um, we, we put a, a, a mirror, uh, like a 2% a mirror into our system to carve off some of the light and send it into a spectrometer so we can measure uh, changes in the laser wavelength. And so in this type of assay, uh, we're preparing the photonic crystal with a capture of proteins, so the big molecule. Um, that are uh, attached by covalent bonds with a, bio, uh, with a linker molecule. And then we expose them to a solution that contains a small molecule, and then we look for binding. Um, because the wavelength shifts that occur with this type of binding are very small, uh, it's necessary to have an active form of sensor referencing um, that, that can you know, take into account any form of you know, environmental variation, uh, thermal expansion, uh, changes in, in the refractive index uh, of the liquid itself uh, due to evaporative cooling. Now, all these things can generate wavelength shifts that can mask the true wavelength shift that we're looking for uh, from the small molecule attachment. And so it's important for us to have a reference sensor that's as identical to the active sensor as possible, but in, in close physical proximity. Um, so, for example, if, if we have you know, an active and a, and a reference sensor and we see some uh, drift over time, you know, even over a 10 or 12 minute period, if we subtract one from the other, then our, our remainder signal allows us to see um, you know, changes that are due to the actual bio biomolecular binding uh, much more clearly. And so to do um, you know, extremely accurate uh, self-referencing, um, we, we use our external cavity system in a slightly different way, where we, we take the output of our optical amplifier, which is unpolarized, uh, we put it through a polarizing beam splitter that, that takes uh, one polarization, sends it to the sensing, the active sensor, the other polarization goes to the control sensor. Uh, both of these optical paths go back to the SOA, and so the, the system is, is able to laze simultaneously at two independent wavelengths, uh, one for the reference and, and one for the active. And so you're doing this, and here just, just to show you, um, you know, the, the photonic crystal resonances for a, an active and a reference sensor um, overlaid with, with the lasing spectrum, you can see how um, using the, the lasing effect uh, we, we can get uh, better sensing resolution. Uh, here's an example of what our, our data looks like. Uh, here at, at a time of two minutes, uh, we introduce uh, in, in separate experiments um, a, a small molecule to the immobilized protein. Uh, and so um, this, this uh, shift as a function of time is the laser wavelength value shift uh, where we're measuring you know, changes in wavelength value on the order of you know, one to five picometers, uh, but still with, with very nice signal to noise ratio. Um, just to show you that these types of measurements are very specific, um, this a uh, green molecule, or, I'm sorry, th th this molecule giving us you know, the, the red um, you know, curve um, is an actual small mo molecule binder uh, for um, this protein. So it's, it's an actual cancer drug. Uh, but you can see with, with these uh, two other molecules that differ only by 
um, one functional group is slightly different, uh, but yet they don't bind. And so we, we see these as, as misses rather than hits. In, in the context of a screening campaign, uh, we're, we're looking at like many molecules. Here just showing a small screen that we did as an example, uh, where uh, the needle in the haystack is this you know, red molecule that actually is a, a hit uh, for a particular uh, molecule, a, a protein called carbonic anhydrase. And so if we uh, look at, uh, at the lasing wavelength value shift from you know, each of these molecules, each done in series, we see that our, our hit actually gives us a, a large uh, you know, measurable uh, picometer of, uh, scale uh, binding signal, uh, whereas the other molecules give you know, either negative or, or small positive shift or, or no shift. Um, and then once we find a hit, this is a small molecule that has a molecular weight of only 324 Daltons. Um, we, we can then do dose response characterization uh, you know, to see that the, the interaction is dose dependent, which is you know, generally a, a good thing in the context of drug screening. Um, the next thing I'd like to share with you is how we use the photonic crystal as a, a fluorescence enhancer. Uh, in, in this context, we're uh, seeking to detect uh, cancer biomarkers in serum. Um, that have extremely low concentrations because these are proteins that are produced by a small tumor um, but within a large person. And so their concentration is dilute uh, by the entire you know, blood supply of the person. But, but if, you, if you take a, a sample of blood from a person's finger, um, those uh, biomarkers will still be present. Uh, here, instead of doing label-free detection, we're, using, we're doing fluorescent detection uh, where we have a, a molecule uh, called cyanine 5, which has a specific absorption and emission spectrum as a fluorescent dye. Uh, and so I'll show you how we're using the cyanine 5 as our detection tag. Oops. Um, here we're, we're making uh, photonic crystals slightly differently. Um, these are made on a silicon wafer. Uh, with, you know, same basic idea, but we have a layer of silicon oxide that's uh, patterned and etched by photolithography um, that, that's then you know, covered with a thin film of titanium oxide. Um, these are made in a foundry on 8-inch wafers, and then we you know, cut them down to smaller size that we uh, use for our tests. So this is just what they look like in the uh, scanning electron microscope. Um, we've also designed and built a, a line scanning detection instrument um, that can, you, know, you take the, the light from a laser diode, uh, couple it through a microscope objective, and to concentrate it into a narrow line on the photonic crystal surface that we scan across to create a fluorescence image. Um, this instrument is around the size of a big toaster, and maybe a really expensive toaster, um, has a cost of components of around you know, $10,000. Um, these photonic crystals are designed to have two resonances at the same time, uh, one that's at the uh, wavelength for cyanine 5 excitation, which is the same wavelength as a laser that's used in our detection instrument, uh, and then you know, the second resonance is designed at the wavelength for cyanine 5 emission, which occurs around 690 nanometers. Um, this assay is called a, a sandwich assay in which we uh, print with a, with a special uh, plotter um, a, an array of capture antibodies, each antibody looking specifically uh, for a, a cancer biomarker in, in solution. And so um, after we do you know, the printing, uh, we would expose our, our chip to a, a serum sample, you know, allow the biomarkers to bind with their capture antibodies, but we're not done yet until we can do the labeling step. And so in this assay, we have a, a, a cocktail of secondary antibodies um, that are exposed to our chip for about five minutes um, that also bind with, with, with a second um, epitope on the cancer biomarker we're seeking and then finally, we have uh, our cyanine 5 tag is applied at the end. Um, here's what a fluorescence image uh, of, of, these, um, of these protein microarrays look like. Uh, here we have a, an assay for doing uh, 28 separate cancer biomarkers. And here I, I just highlighted one intermediate concentration, around 10 uh, picograms per ml, uh, that shows that the biomarkers are not detectable on, on a glass substrate. But if we perform the, the experiment on a photonic crystal, we can see them very easily. Um, just quickly, I wanted to share some of the, the highlight results. Um, he, here's a dose response curve for tumor necrosis factor alpha, a, a cancer biomarker. Um, going down to the lowest concentrations of around 2.7 picograms per ml, we still have a signal to noise ratio of 25. Um, we've been doing a multiplexed cancer biomarker detection. These are, are all uh, biomarkers detected at the same time in serum, from all with detection limits below or near or below a one picogram per ml. Uh, within a single droplet of blood, our test sample is only 10 microliters. Um, this represents you know, only you know, 0.4 atomolars of material is actually present in the sample. Um, more, most recently, we've been integrating our photonic crystal enhanced fluorescence uh, device into a, a plastic microfluidic uh, platform that allows the assay to be automated. And I hope to be able to share results from this with you 
uh, yeah, perhaps uh, next uh, IEEE sensors conference. Um, the, the final thing I wanted to share with you is a, a new approach to microscopy uh, that uses photonic crystals that they call, of course, you know, photonic crystal enhanced microscopy. And so here our, our work is motivated by wanting to look at things that cells do. Um, you know, cells are difficult to look at uh, under a microscope because they don't have much uh, contrast. Uh, so people seek to get contrast by adding you know, stains or, or dyes uh, that unfortunately are, are toxic to the cells. So you can look at dead cells. Um, or uh, if in the case of fluorescent dyes, uh, think they will uh, photo bleach after a short amount of time. And so after 30 seconds of looking at your cells, you know, they go dark. Uh, but, but cells have, you know, have long and interesting lives. Uh, people are you know, interested in seeing what stem cells do while they differentiate, what cancer cells do while they metastasize, uh, what biofilms do as they grow. And so we're interested in, in a platform that allows label-free detection over long periods of time without you know, labels or stains. And, and so our, our goal here is to use the evanescent field of the photonic crystal um, as, as a means for seeing the bottom part of a cell as it attaches to the photonic crystal surface and then spreads over time. Um, as the cell incorporates on the photonic crystal surface, um, it, it you know, causes you know, changes in the reflected wavelength that, are, that occur only at the place where the cell is, as I'll show you, uh, both in terms of you know, shifting um, the resonance wavelength and also you know, changing the resonance magnitude if there happens to be a source of, of loss or absorption uh, from that, that cell. And so we, our, our detection system um, looks like this. We, we have a, a low intensity broadband LED um, that goes through a polarizer and illuminates our photonic crystal from below. The reflected light goes back through the objective and then goes into an imaging spectrometer. So same basic phenomena as before. Um, this is what our system looks like in real life. So we've built it, incorporated it into a, a regular um, white light microscope, but added a new illumination path. And then our spectrometer is over here. And the system has a cell incubator built onto it so that we can keep the cells alive uh, for long periods of time. And so you know, to make a photonic crystal microscope image, um, we, we can think of each pixel on the photonic crystal surface area having its own individual uh, reflectance uh, wavelength spectrum. We illuminate one whole line at a time. And so our imaging spectrometer is actually able to generate, is to measure the spectrum of every position along that line at once. Um, to make a two-dimensional image, then we scan our line, and so then we have a three-dimensional stack of data, each pixel represented uh, by a reflectance spectrum. And then we, we uh, make an image by determining the peak wavelength value of each spectra from that stack of 3D data. And so you know, the image that we get looks like this. Uh, so here's just a regular bright field image of some uh, pancreatic cancer cells. Uh, and then here's the photonic crystal microscope image, where now we're looking at units of peak reflected wavelength value. So a place where a cell is, is, is shifted over slightly to a place uh, where the cell is not. And then just, just zooming in, you can see some interesting features now, that, that the cells have you know, interesting outlines where places where their filopodia and lamino, laminar extensions are reaching out. Within an individual cell, we can see places where the uh, attachment density is higher than others. And within cells, there's even places where the, the, the attached density is less. Uh, and so we can look at all sorts of interesting behavior. Um, once you can take a, a static image of some cell attachment, uh, next thing you want to do is to uh, look at the same cells uh, several times. And so um, here's a, a set of images for uh, dental stem cells you know, attaching to a photonic crystal uh, where um, here's some cells sitting on the photonic crystal surface, but they haven't attached yet. Um, they start to register an attachment a point, which then spreads over time. And then over the course of more than an hour, these cells spread out in a very interesting way. Um, if you look at these three pixels uh, near the boundary of, of this cell, um, we, we can see how the, the cell attachment front spreads, and this red spectrum shifts from being on the left to being over on, on the right um, as that cell moves across it. And so you know, now we, we can make a cell attachment movies uh, where we can see how you know, the cell evolution boundary and the cell motion um, you know, change as a function of time with respect to the attached cell density. Um, the, these images were taken at 10-minute increments. We've actually updated our, our system to be able to take faster images uh, that, that can occur at 10-second increments. Um, the, the finally, we've added one more thing uh, to this photonic crystal enhanced microscope, uh, which is a, a path that can do fluorescence imaging and enhanced fluorescence imaging. And so we, we've added you know, a laser that couples to the uh, photonic crystal sensor, uh, and then we can excite uh, fluorescence. And so. Uh, here, if we look at, at an image of, of uh, cells stained with fluorescent dye um, taken off resonance and on resonance, 
Um, these are the same cells looked at right in series, but the, you can see the fluorescent intensities in this scale are very different from in that scale due to the, to the, due to the fluorescence enhancement. And so we, with this system, um, we, we can do things like make an enhancement factor image um, that it tells us you know, information about how uh, close to the surface uh, these fluorescence emitters are. And so we've been doing work with uh, membrane uh, fluorescent dye stains and also nu nuclear dye stains uh, where we can you know, stain you know, structures uh, inside and outside the cell and look at how closely they're incorporated you know, near the photonic crystal surface. Uh, so uh, to conclude, um, you know, photonic nanostructures and, and particularly photonic crystals have a, a lot of interesting applications uh, in, in biology. And we, we've seen you know, just an enormous variety of you know, very you know, clever uh, photonic crystal you know, formats, both in terms of the devices themselves and the, the detection instruments um, that can do label-free detection and, and now uh, fluorescence enhancement. Um, it, it is important uh, to consider not only the photonic crystal structure itself, but also how you would design a detection instrument that can take advantage of its unique properties. And so what I showed you a few examples today uh, where we're using a, a, a smartphone um, as a portable detection instrument for a photonic crystal label-free assay, um, a, a toaster-sized photonic crystal fluorescence enhancer, and then even a, a photonic crystal sensing integrated with microscopy. Uh, so, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge my, my students who did all the hard work here, and then our funding from NIH and NSF, and then you know, the collaborators that, that worked with us. And then I'd like to thank you and ask for your questions.